So um, yeah, let's just get right into it. There's a couple of just like trivial organizational things. First of all, um, the slides that I have here, I've put made them available online. So I put the link in the chat, but you can also, I mean, if you're able to read my handwriting, then you can also see it from here. It's a Google page. I must admit that this is a Google page I created for some other course and I didn't create a new page, but I did create new slides. So this is, uh, uh, so you can find the slides in the top of that. So as I said, I'll make the slides available always before the lecture. And also one thing that I want to just point out in case you don't scroll so far, I'll do something horrible, which is I'll go to the very end of the slide. So I have all the references for stuff that I'll be talking about here in the end. So you can uh, I'll probably not scroll there, but you can find them there. Um, so then if I read the, uh, I mean, also, if I understand correctly, the organizers will make recordings of this and they will be made available. And I don't know how this will happen, but I trust the organizers to get that sorted. Um, finally, so the, if I read the schedule correctly, so I have lectures here Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, or an hour and a half and Friday for one hour. Um, so this is more of a asking the organizer organizers for confirmation that I did read it correctly. And uh, finally, I mean, always, if there's a question that cannot be resolved during the course, um, please send me an email and we'll try to, I mean, I don't know how well this will work in this hybrid setup, but I would really like this to be as interactive as possibly can be. So I'll make pauses and uh, shout. And uh, for those who are in the, in, the, in, the, in the Zoom as well, please put things in the chat. I'll be... I'll be uh, monitor monitoring the chat. And uh, so, yeah, please let's try to keep it interactive. Right, I mean, now let me start with like a couple of just philosophical statements and just to um, to embed uh, what I want to to talk about in a bigger picture. So there's this, this, um, this uh, I mean, this is a workshop which is called Indexing Particle System and Hydrodynamic Limits. So clearly people are aware of the fact that in many situations, the effective behavior on large scales of interacting particle systems can, can be effectively described by a nonlinear PDE. That's the so-called hydrodynamic limit. And this is what this whole workshop is about, of course. And I mean, here's just one example that I've copied from, from, from uh, Kipnis and Landim's book. Uh, for example, that, uh, that in certain situations, the, the zero range process can be described effectively by a porous medium equation. And, then if one wants to zoom in further, what one often sees is that one has some fluct the fluctuation limit, and that is typically given by a linear stochastic partial differential equation. So just in this flavor of a CLT, you have Gaussian fluctuations around the deterministic um, kind of law of large number, if you want. So what I'm going to talk about in these lectures here is a more, spe a more special situation. And this arises, for example, near instabilities of the hydrodynamic limit that one can actually kind of tune a system to get non-Gaussian fluctuations or, I mean, described by a nonlinear SPDE. And so my claim sort of for this course is that this is interesting and I want to show you how, how this happens and how this can be derived. And now perhaps perhaps in a slightly less, oh, no, that is before there, there here's, here's the, the standard example where, which is classical from the 90s the convergence of the weekly asymmetric simple exclusion process to the KPZ equation, um, again, proved by in this, this really famous paper by Bertini and Giacomini in the 90s. And this goes something like that. So this is the solid on solid model, SOS, which, uh, which looks like that. So the evolution is a Markov process on configurations like this, this, these configurations like that. So these are just functions from Z to Z uh, and the increments between two points are always, so they always go up or go down. And um, so how the dynamics of this one works is if you have such a corner down here, then uh, particles can rain from the sky and they can then fall down here. Uh, and they can only fall in corners that these downward corners that look like that. Or what can happen also is that if you have an upward corner like this one here or like this one here, then this upward corner can be removed and uh, kind of go back to the sky if you want. And uh, so this is here what I have in this. Uh, so these green green uh, squares here are particles that rain from the sky, and then the blue squares here are particles that uh, that get removed from the interface. And this is a I mean a very simple model for an interface in, in one plus one dimension. Uh, and what uh, what Bertini and Jacomin suggested is to do this in a 
in a very specific way so that uh, you deposit particles slightly quicker than you remove them. So the rate, I mean, all of these happen with Poisson clocks and blah, blah, blah. So I mean, but that the rate of, of depositing these particles is slightly bigger. So you have the small parameter epsilon here um, uh, uh, than the, um, then the removal. So this only happens at rate a half. Um, and uh, so what you would then expect is that the particles uh, that the particles move upward because they, the slightly more particles get deposited than then get removed. And uh, to leading order, this is indeed correct. So you have an upward motion which moves roughly at speeds epsilon to a half in, in line with this epsilon to a half. And if you want kind of to link the to connect this to this more philosophical picture before this would be the leading order hydrodynamic limit. You just have say a constant pro constant profile that moves up with speed epsilon to a half, so pretty slow. And now this uh, this this kind of uh, I claim to be interesting regime is uh, if we look at the fluctuations around that. So what we do here is we uh, we look at this field on large temporal scales. So we accelerate time with an epsilon to the minus two. We look at large spatial scales. So we we we, multi, we, we scale time, space with epsilon to the minus one. We remove the leading order term here, uh, which now is uh, is pretty big because this is now. I mean, originally the motion was epsilon to the a half, so it was small. But now we have accelerated time with an epsilon to the minus two, so the leading order speed now becomes epsilon to the minus three half. If you look at it in this scale, and then there's a, a correction that I don't want to talk about here. Um, and then you look at this resulting thing and make it small again. Okay, so this is the the scale on which one sees was, and what Bertini and Jacobin proved in the 90s is that you, this is given by the KPZ equation. So the um, so that you can uh, can really describe. Uh, these fluctuations here by such a nonlinear stochastic PDE here. So you have here the, the interface H is given by, you have a Laplacian here. So this is a linear operator. You have here a Xi. Xi for me will always be space-time white noise. And I will explain what that is much later down. So don't worry so much about it. But the, uh, the bit that I want to stress here only is that you have such a nonlinear term here. And as a rule of thumb, the, the uh, a nonlinear equation uh, uh, well, unlike an Ornstein Uhlenbeck equation for a nonlinear equation, this will always, always lead to, um, to non Gaussian dynamics. Okay. And I mean, I want, don't want to talk about this in much detail here. So please don't worry so much about it at this stage. But the, the only point I want to perhaps already stress at this point is A, that these nonlinear fluctuations arise only in a very specific scaling. So you have to really tune all your parameters in exactly the right way to see this. And um, the second point I want to note here on this one is this is in, in a, a bit of a peculiar scaling limit because the model actually changes as you zoom out. So you see there was this parameter epsilon that parameterized the nonlinear, the, the, this, um, this asymmetry, but at the same end, but you use the same parameter epsilon to uh, scale space and time. So as you zoom, as you zoom out, uh, the, the, the more you zoom out, the small, which, which is parametered by this epsilon, the smaller the symmetry gets. So in a sense, the more symmetric you get. And only in such a, in such a, a scaling where, the, um, where the, 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 the kind of the asymmetry of the model, if you want the nonlinearity of the model uh, becomes smaller as you zoom out, you can get such a nonlinear non stochastic PDE. And this has to do with the scaling of the equation. And I will come back to that in uh, the next lecture on Wednesday. And the last point, I mean, there is this, uh, this funny infinity term here uh, that I will, I mean, also talk about later. Uh, don't worry about it so much at this point. Uh, but just to already remember, we will down the line need to talk about renormalization. OK. Perhaps this is a good point already to have a very quick 30 second break. Is there a question or is this clear? Good. Um, so the example that I want to actually talk about in this course is not the, the KPZ equation, is but actually I talk about uh, this the conversion of the Katz easing model to, to the 5.4 SPDE, which actually in flavor is very similar to this uh, to this KPZ result that we had. And this is something that in the in the one-dimensional case. So I mean, there. I mean, okay. The, the KPZ always lives in one plus one dimension, and this 5-4 equation has the parameter of the spatial dimension in which we look at things. 
And uh, the one dimensional situation was already treated in the 90s. So there's this work by, uh, well, by Tini Pasotti, Rüdiger and Sada from the early 90s and then Fritz and Rüdiger a little bit later. Um, and let me also here mention really a, a beautiful and very inspiring survey article that, that from the late 90s by Jacobin Leibowitz Pasutti that did all the formal derivation. Everything I will show you later uh, was already contained in this thing. And sort of what was missing to go to higher dimensions was a good solution theory actually for these uh, for this higher dimensional um, for this for these higher dimensional equations. And then that became available in the last years. And so the, the two-dimensional case was resolved by, by Jean-Christophe Morat and myself a couple of years ago. Uh, and then there's also this follow-up by, um, by Haira and Diberti. And the main reason why I'm actually giving these lectures now is that uh, uh, together with my, my student, Paolo Gwaseski and, um, and Konstantin Mateski from Columbia University, we have, well, we're in the process of finishing the paper in, in a 3D case. And I figured that this was a good occasion to speak about this topic again. Um, let me also make, before I get into things, let me make, so wait, there's something in the chat. Ah, no, okay. Um, let me just also make a technical disclaimer about the technical, I mean, about the nature of what I will speak about. So if you look at the literature on hydrodynamic limits, then often questions that are discussed are replacement, lemmata, Boltzmann principle, uh, and so forth. So the, 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 the difficulty that is addressed is often uh, the question of how to characterize limiting the, the, the limiting equation. And what one has to do often is to show statements of the type that uh, local averages of nonlinear quantities, well, of the particle, can be replaced by nonlinear functions of local averages. Okay, so you have, um, so this is really in order to be able to close an equation in the limit and to, to write down even an equation that could be solved by the limit. Um, this is not at all what I will be doing here today, because in this uh, in this cuts easing problem, this 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 problem is completely absent. Because once I mean I will come back to that later, but if you apply the generator to local averages, you immediately get an almost closed equation. And um, uh, so I mean I think Milton once told me that cuts easing was actually cheating. It's not really an interacting particle system. Uh, and uh, so the, in, in reality, this will really be a course on numerical approximations to SPDEs in disguise, where you have a reasonable numerical scheme for the SPDE in the beginning. And then I will uh, sort of uh, mimic the solution theory that we have on continuum on the discrete, discrete level and show you uh, leverage stability that we, we have in the solution theory. So, um, so technically, it'll possibly look quite different from what one is used to if you hear go to a course on hydrodynamic limits. Okay, so this was my uh, my technical disclaimer. So again, this is my ambitious uh, outline of what I want to do today. So the main, the bulk of what I want to do today is actually I discuss a toy case and I'll actually talk about the Curie-Weiss model. So this is even, even, even more cheating than cuts easing. So this is uh, the geometry is completely absent and I derive kind of the, the ODE version of, the, of my result and I discuss but I think, okay, I'm going through this in quite a bit of detail. And my main motivation for doing this is because this, um, this picture, this philosophical picture that I, I kind of tried to outline in the first slide that you have the hydrodynamic limit and then you have linear fluctuations, but only in a very specific equation a situation, you get nonlinear fluctuations. I think this is a very nice example in which one can illustrate all of this pretty easily in a, um, in, well, in a technically not so difficult uh, framework. So I, I go through this in quite a bit of detail. And uh, depending on how quick I go, I'll also then start to go from there to cuts easing, which now here in my, well, in my outline I've put in lecture two. And then what I want to do uh, on Wednesday is, is discuss scaling for SPDEs, in particular tell you about subcriticality, and then give a half an hour primer on, on the solution theories of 542 and 543. So this will be my 30 minutes course on regularity structures. And uh, then a, a bulk of what I do in the third lecture on Thursday is I'll talk about iterated stochastic integrals and continuum and discrete. And in particular, I'll explain to you how to do a uh, kind of, I mean, what, what Wiener Ito chaos decomposition means in continuum and how you can mimic this, this for jump martingales. So if you know about the regularity structures, I'll be bounding the trees. And then, then lecture four in one hour, I'll wave my hand a lot and I'll kind of tell you how to conclude the argument when you, once you have the, have, the, uh, this, have, the, have the trees. Okay, 
I mean, if you didn't understand really what I was uh, saying here, then again, don't worry. I mean, of course, I will go through this in a lot more detail in, uh, as, 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 as the week progresses. I mean, perhaps another 30 seconds. Is there anybody who has a question at this point? So this is, of course, I mean, also for pretty meta. So um, I will, in, in all of these lectures, they discuss uh, models of easing type. And let me perhaps, again, I presume that most of you will be well familiar with that. But uh, let me, if, if, you, if you are not, then let me still remind you of the, um, of kind of the, the key points for a few minutes. So the, the easing model in, in general, I mean, the, you're looking at uh, uh, the, the state space for the easing model are you fixed yourself some, some graph. I mean, in this case, a subset of Z2 or Zd. Um, and uh, the, the configurations on which this lives are, uh, are, are plus minus one valued functions on this lattice. So I've kind of drawn, drawn this in this cartoon here. Uh, every site is associated a value either plus one or minus one. And this is indicated by these red dots or the, black, the blue dots here. And uh, so we're trying to um, well give a probability distribution or we are going to define a probability distribution on all such configuration. And this is done by associating to each configuration, this Hamiltonian, this energy, which has, uh, I mean, this form here, you sum over, over all pairs of sites i and j, you have this interaction term here, kappa a j, I, a, I, j, and then you multiply this spins and it's, this is a ferromagnetic model. So you have a minus a hat in front. And then you, uh, you uh, define these Gibbs measures here uh, that, um, that just means that a given configuration, the higher the energy, the lower the probability of this uh, given configuration is. And this factor beta in front just uh, measures how much we care about the energy. So large uh, beta means that we care a lot about this uh, Hamiltonian and small beta means we don't care so much. And the interpretation is always that beta is somehow the inverse temperature. So the, uh, the, the higher the beta, the smaller the temperature, the more we care about the, the, the Hamiltonian. So the, the less we have the ability to, to kind of uh, go into uh, to, to configurations with, with high Hamiltonian. And the heuristics are, of course, if you just look at this, uh, this expression, sigma i multiplied with sigma j, well, you can calculate it's minus a half if they, if they are aligned, or it's plus a half if they're not. That's not complicated. And so this means that you can also rewrite this Hamiltonian for a configuration here as uh, just the sum over everything with a minus a half. And this is a constant that doesn't depend on the configuration. And then plus this term which does depend on the configuration where you, um, where you just sum over all the pairs of spins that uh, are not aligned. And then here you measure how much you care that they're not aligned in this interaction term. So what you think is this, this, um, this Hamiltonian is really up to this constant that, of course, uh, disappears here also in the normalization. So we don't care about that. Up to this uh, constant here, the Hamiltonian just counts or it gives you a, a weighted count of the number of disagreements. Uh, so, this, this, uh, and, uh, so then what you have in this model is this competition between energy and entropy. So energy tells you you like to have all the spins aligned. Um, but of course, I mean, the entropy point is that there's much more, there are much more configurations that uh, have their spins all over the place. And there's only two configurations that have all aligned. And so this uh, parameter beta then has to decide which of these effects wins. And again, I mean, this is just a, um, this is just a, a plot of the, the, the behavior of the easing model. So this is the low temperature regime. So uh, high values of beta. Here we care a lot about the Hamiltonian. So it's, it's, it's very costly for the system to, uh, to have spins that are, um, uh, that are different. And you see, I mean, this is the nearest neighbor easing where, uh, where, um, where, uh, where, where the kappa is just one if you have, if you have neighbors and uh, it's uh, zero elsewhere. Uh, but I mean, even though you have only this nearest neighbor interaction, you see you have this effect, this long range order where the spin here and the spin here really still want to be aligned. And then here you have the uh, high temperature regime where uh, beta is uh, very small. And you see here, this is basically noise. So the spin here doesn't care about the spin here at all. And here you see really this effect that, uh, um, that, um, uh, that uh, you have many, many, many more configurations where the spins are not aligned than, than the fact that, uh, that, that they are, then, then configurations where they are aligned. And if the beta is relatively small, then the, um, 
the, the, the energetic advantage cannot compensate the entropic advantage from the fact that there are so many more. And then here in the middle, you have this critical regime where the uh, where they uh, where they the, these two balance. Again, I assume that many of or basically everybody in the room has seen pictures of this type before, and nobody will be shocked about this. I'll give you thirty seconds to object to that statement. <laughs> okay, nobody objects. Thanks, Paul, for 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 uh, for for shaking your head. I can just about recognize what you do. <laughs> Milton, yeah. I have an objection. Please do. So, one, two, three. In the third picture, I imagine that it will be even more disordered than that. Oh, okay. I don't know. I mean, I must admit that I didn't do that uh, simulation and I, uh, I took it from Google. So, I'm, it's not my fault, is my answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, I must I must admit I don't quite know which temperature they took so possibly there I, I possibly it was not so far away from criticality I'm not sure all right good so this is the uh, easing model but what I want to do now here is um, is uh, something much easier actually for the next at least 45 minutes or so and I'll actually talk about the mean field easing model or the Curie Weiss model and what uh, as a rule of thumb here we're just going to forget about the geometry of the lattice. Uh, so this means I'm just going to index my spins here, not by a lattice anymore, but just by well, by one to n. And uh, so I'm just going to look at configurations which, uh, well, uh, of tuples, n tuples of um, of uh, of uh, of spins. And so the Hamiltonian uh, now takes this form here. They have this X, I put this this normalization one over n in front, which is convenient. Uh, so this is just the, the the special case of the easing model before, uh, where this kappa ij is always one over n for each pair i of j. And another way of seeing this is just the easing model on the complete graph. So I hope you're uh, impressed with my patience for drawing a complete graph on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen in, uh, 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 on th thirteen um, uh, vertices yesterday night. Uh, so in this case, if you look at this, this Curie Weiss model, many things become much, much easier than in the uh, easing case. Uh, and this, this is mostly because you, um, uh, well, I mean, I'm just, but because of the following manipulation that is not particularly complicated, of course. Uh, so I'm just going to take this expression here and I'm from here to here, I've done nothing but just written the double sum, well, as two sums, okay? So I've just written the sum over I, pulled the sigma i out and then uh, pulled this one out, okay? And then I just call this quantity here mean magnetization. So this is the average of all the, well, the average magnetization, right? I mean, you just take the, take all the spins and take their average. The name, is the, what, what's on the tin is, uh, yeah, this is correct. And then you see, I mean, this number doesn't depend on j, of course, anymore. And then you can do the same again. And what you get here is that uh, minus a half n times the magne mean magnetization squared. Um, and so the, uh, the Hamiltonian is completely described in terms of the mean magnetization. And in fact, you can actually analyze this model um, I mean, you can sort of map everything to just the analysis of the mean magnetization, and that, uh, of course, is much easier than this complicated uh, this complicated uh, state space. Um, and then, as before, we're going to define uh, the Gibbs measure. Just, I mean, as we should, the the uh, with, with the Hamiltonian weighted weighted by the beta. And now, what I want to do, which is, um, I mean, eventually, I would like to get to a stochastic dynamics, and I want to get. Uh, later as PDEs, but for the moment only as DEs appearing. So I want to introduce some sort of dynamics. And the way I do that, I mean, is, I mean, I hope not so surprising to many, many, to too many of you here. So I, I, I'm going to look at the so-called Lauber or heat bath dynamics, which means, so you see in this picture that I've drawn here, um, you have here my sites, one, two, three, four, up to N. And each of these sites here has an independent Poisson clock. So this means that, uh, Right, I mean, I just uh, as Poissonian times with rate one, I have these uh, these well, I call them alarm I mean, uh, uh, Poisson clocks, so they ring at a certain time. But it's just a, if you want exponential waiting times between these things at rate one, and they happen independently. Uh, this means in particular that uh, almost surely one never sees two of these clocks ringing at the same time. And then when one of them rings, so for example at this event or at this event. 
what one does is one looks the the part that here looks looks around it, and then decides if the if it wants to change its uh, sign the flips uh, the, the 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 side decides if it wants to change its sign or not, and it does this with a certain probability, and this is given by here, by this one here. So this is the probability uh, that if I have a I have a um, if if at uh, a given time my uh, my Poisson clock rings. I, I, um, I, I flip signs with a probability here. This is the, the invariant measure. So this lambda beta of the configuration where the sign has flipped. And then I normalize the whole thing by the probability of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the, uh, the, of the, uh, the configuration with the unflipped sign. And then here plus the configuration with a flip sign. This is just the normalization. So, I mean, what you can see, for example, in particular, just by looking at this a bit with your, with your I mean, what you can see immediately is that if, um, if flipping the sign increases the probability, you're more likely to do it than if it decreases the probability, right? I mean, that's that this number becomes bigger. And uh, another thing to just note immediately, I mean, it's obvious that this number here is always in, uh, is always in, uh, in zero one, right? I mean that's 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 pretty obvious because you divide by you divide something and here you have the same thing here plus something bigger so it uh, it better be in zero one. Uh, and another re remark is that actually more more accurately it's actually typically uh, typically flipping the sign here is not going to change the probability by so much. I mean this is a pretty big system and just flipping a single side just changes the probability by a tiny bit. So this means that typically this is actually going to be pretty close to a half plus plus a little bit. Okay, so to leading order, one should think of this being being close to a half. Um, and another thing to note from that formula immediately is that you have the detailed balance condition. So if you multiply the probability, uh, the probability uh, of a given configuration times the Times the the times the rate at which you jump from that probability from that given configuration to the configuration with a spin uh, with a spin at position i flipped, then this is the same as the probability of the of the configuration with the side with a spin at side i flipped back to the original configuration. Right. So this is a, I mean you see this immediately if you just uh, right. I mean multiplying with this here just puts that here, and I mean this gives you this. Right? I mean. I don't want to speak about this very much because from the formula, it's pretty obvious. Does everybody see that immediately? Yeah. So I see, see Paul nodding, but you're, you're pretty small actually. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> I think we're good. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So this, is a, this, so this defines a reversible Markov process with respect to this, this measure lambda beta. And we can down, write down the generator of this. Um, uh, so, I mean, this is uh, just this operator, right? So, I mean, so you have a test function. Which lives on con which lives on configurations, and uh, so you sum over all the possible moves that you can make. So the moves that are allowed are just sign flips at uh, at any of the given sides from one to n. Here's the rate at which this event happens, and then here you have the change of this given function if you have made that change. So again, Perhaps I give you 15 seconds to object if you've never seen a generator of a Markov process of, or something like that. But given this is a summer school on interacting particle systems, I'm feeling confident that you have seen expressions like this before. Good. So now I'm going to start calculating a little bit. Um, so the first thing to note in the following calculation is that if you change the, the, the just a the single spin, then the average changes, of course, but, but not by so much. So you can uh, you can write the the average of the configuration with the spin at side k in terms of the average of the original uh, configuration, and you just change it by well two over n, right? I mean because you just flip a single spin, and so this goes either from plus one to minus one, so the change is two, but then you normalize by n, so this is just two over n, and then well depending on the sign of sigma, it either goes up or down. So this is uh, okay. This is this is easy to uh, useful to note. And now I'm going to rewrite that uh, that rate function c. And I'm going to rewrite it. Okay, this is just the definition. Here I've done absolutely nothing. 
And the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to rewrite it as, uh, right, I mean, I write this here, A, kind of, if this is A, I write this as A minus B over two plus A plus B over two. And uh, so this gives me that. So, and then here I have this with a minus term, this gives me that. Okay, again, I mean, this was not a very deep manipulation. And now I'm just going to remember what this actually was. So this measure here um, was, uh, this is the Gibbs measure. So you have e to the minus beta times this Hamiltonian of the configuration. And let me remind you, or perhaps let's do this one first. So e to the minus beta, the Hamiltonian and the Hamiltonian had exactly this form we had calculated was minus a half n times the magnetism mean magnetization squared. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm just plugging in what we had before. And then here I do, um, I do something, something similar, except that I have, of course, the mean magnetization of the flipped configure of the flipped configuration, but quite handy that we have already calculated that. And I'm just going to plug that in here. Okay. So the formula looks a bit longer, but nothing so complicated so far. And the next thing I'm going to do here is I'm just going to remind myself of uh, of elementary trigonometric uh, identities. So you can always write e to the a, e to the a minus e to the b over e to the a plus e to the b as tanj a minus b over two. This is something that I'll leave as an exercise. I mean, you can also check if I did this correct. So I, I, the, the, this was last night. So it's, uh, yeah, last night it was true. I hope it's still true today. Uh, so let's plug this in here. Then you get here a half times, well, this one is just copied from here, and this is now this tanj. And uh, what you get here is this a, a minus b over two. If you plug in these values of a and b, is you get here tanj of, uh, uh, of, of this term here, and um, you get a beta over n. And um, now I'm going to use as a final step the fact that the tanj function is odd, and that allows me to pull out that minus, so that minus pull come goes down here. And uh, the sigma goes down here. And uh, then of course, I mean, this term didn't have the sign, so I have to put a minus here and the sigma here, okay? So that's all of them. Everybody happy with this uh, manipulation? Paul? I think we've got a question in the room. Oh yeah, excellent, yeah. So, so the question is, there. it's for one value of sigma r equal to plus or minus one, it's not a matrix or is it a vector? Um, I mean, sigma is a configuration yeah. that associates to each uh, each value between one and n oh, number. Either okay, so number. that's uh, that's not a scalar writing; it's a vectorial writing. This uh, this uh, this formula with sigma outside. Uh, I mean, I mean, I, uh, well, perhaps that should be a bit. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, so the, perhaps I should clarify my notation if that's the question. So the sigma k the, with the index on, on top is. Uh, the vector sigma ki for i from one to n, and this is uh, with the with the fact with the, with the sigma ki is equal to the original sigma i for i not equal to k, and is minus sigma k for i equal to k. Does this make sense? So I write the lower, I write the lower case index here to denote a single spin for a given side k. And I write the upper index for a whole configuration with spin uh, with spin flipped at position k. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. And this was also an answer to the question, or did I misunderstand the question? Yes, no, no. That's it. Yep. That's it. Okay, so yeah. So sorry if I wasn't clear about that. Okay, um, let me perhaps just in the, the last thing I want to stress is this error term here is actually slightly, uh, slightly ugly. So this is, uh, I would mostly disregard this. So this is just the term of, of, term of, form of, uh, of the form one over N. And this comes from this uh, A minus B here. I mean, you have here the square and you have the cross term. You want to basically take the difference between this and this one here. And you have the cross term, which is nice. That gives me this term. And then you have the square of that one, which gives me this term. Um, 
and uh, it would be really nice if I could discuss it away, but I, I can't. Well, I'll, this means I'll have to cheat. So I'll basically, it's, it's small and I'll basically disregard it in the future, but um, yeah. Okay, good. So this is, um, this, is uh, this calculation. Um, let's uh, do some, do that through the next step in our analysis of this. So the observable that we will always focus on is M, the mean magnetization. And uh, once one starts analyzing such a, such a dynamics, it's I think almost always a good idea and as the first step to write down a, a formula of this type here where you write the observable at time T as the observable at time one. And then you have here this integral of the generator and then you have a, a martingale. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, I, would, I would claim that this is uh, always a good idea to do this as a first step in the analysis of an interacting particle system. Uh, happy to hear, uh, hear opposing of opinions. If somebody that doesn't think it's always a good idea or has a good counter example, I'm happy to hear about it. Um, but this is, a, this is quite handy because it gives you a decomposition into something that I would call here the drift here. And uh, here, the, the, the martingale, I will view this as the noise, as the, as, the, as the random fluctuations in the process. And now let's just plug in and do the calculation. Again, I mean, there's quite a bit of calculation that I will be doing today. Um, so this generator here, if you apply it to the uh, magnetization of a given spin configuration sigma, so what we do is we sum over all possible sides k, and then at rate c sigma of k, c sigma k, um, this, this sign would flip here. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the kind of the test function, the f that we plug in our, tele, uh, in our, in our uh, generator is just the mean magnetization here. And so here we have the mean magnetization of the, of the configuration with the, with, this, uh, with the spin at side k flipped. And we compare it to the mean magnetization of the spin, well, which is not flipped. And that we have just calculated. This just gives you a minus two sigma k over n. Um, and okay, now let's plug in. So this I have copied here, nothing smart. And here I'm just plugging in the definition. So the C sigma k here, I'm using the calculation from the previous slide. This is here all in uh, yellow. So I have this a half one minus this, um, uh, this, uh, this tunch term. Uh, let me perhaps also just like, uh, I mean, to, to, to get the ideas right in, in, in everybody's mind. So typically, uh, this, one, this a half here is the leading order uh, contribution of this. And this tunch term here will be, uh, should be smaller. Okay, so this is just, uh, uh, yeah, typically the case. Um, okay, good. Uh, so we, we do that. And now we cancel that two with that two and we plug in. So you have here this uh, minus uh, sigma k over n. I've put that here in the first term. The one over n goes here. The minus sigma k goes here. That multiplies with one. So that gives you here exactly that sum. Uh, and you will recognize that this is just, again, minus the mean magnetization, which is convenient. And then for the second term here, with coming that comes from here, I have, again, the one over n that I copy here. I have that sum that I copy here. And then I have the nice, the convenient fact that sigma k times sigma k is always one, right? I mean, the square of either minus one or plus one is either, uh, is either one, is always one, so I can drop it. And then you have here um, the tunge of, uh, of beta m and then with this uh, error term here. Um, and so what you get, and this is quite nice, is that you, you can actually write down what the generator does uh, just in terms of the mean magnetization plus this error term here that I will, uh, again, mostly brush under the rug in this calculation. This is smaller. And this is sort of the first instance of what I referred to already at the beginning, that in a sense, I mean, this will be also true in the cuts model, but it's also very true in the mean field model, that it's a bit of cheating that you don't have to, I mean, you will not have to replace any nonlinear quantities by from microscopic to microscopic, because at this level, we will already get a pretty much closed equation just in terms of the, the observable we're interested in. Okay, good. Um, so that's, uh, that's this. Now let's have a look at the, if you want, the noise term here. Um, so the martingale, of course, by definition is just, I mean, this is just the definition, right? We look at our magnetization minus the starting point minus this generator. 
And the first thing that one no notices from writing it this way is of course this martingale can jump obviously. And it jumps precisely when, when, uh, when there's, a, sp when there's a, a spin flip, right? When at some given site K, the spin sigma goes over to minus sigma. Uh, because this part, of course, is continuous. It's an integral over over uh, over a function. So this over so this is a this this part doesn't jump. The only part that can jump is this one here. And if this part if this happens if such an event then m jumps, but the jump is actually pretty small because you remember uh, that uh, a, fl a flip of sign at a given site on the level of the mean magnetization gives you only a two over n because we have these. Um, but the observable we look at uh, it looks at averages, so the individual spins only have a contribution of two over n on, onto the total thing. So that's that's a good thing, and that will I mean at least later I will use this to say well I can basically think of this as a Brownian noise, so I can basically even though there are jumps I can basically pretend there are no jumps and I pretend it's a Brownian motion, and I will do this in a bit more a bit more justified later on the level of the of the in the, in the space time case. But for today, I'll just wave my hands and do that. And uh, the second thing uh, that uh, we now use in order to, to measure the, the noise strength of, the, of this is the predictable quadratic, quadratic variation. And let me just quickly, quickly remind you of how that is defined. So for a, a martingale, you define this uh, this uh, I mean, this pointy bracket here, the predictable quadratic variation, as, as as follows. So you take a partition of your time up to t, and I've drawn this in the sketch here. So here's your time. Let's just say for the moment. Uh, let's I don't know, that's a good color red. So let's see. Here's our final time t for the moment, and now we take a partition of this interval zero capital t into small subintervals of uh, length delta t. And that what we do is for each, we sum over each of these intervals. And for each of the intervals, we take the increment of the martingale on that interval. We square it as we normally do in a, in a, in a quadratic variation, also in the continuous case. And now what we do, the important thing is we now take the con conditional expectation of that uh, conditioned on everything up to time i. Um, OK, so I mean, I'm more of a continuous person normally, so I Therefore, I will assume, which is possibly not justified, that you're also more of a continuous version and are more used to this for Brownian motion. So, for example, for Brownian motion, if you see this in a course in stochastic calculus, you would typically not do this conditioning. Uh, but if you did the conditioning, then you would get the same result as if you didn't do it. So, for continuous martingales, the, the predictable quadratic variation and the kind of normal quadratic variation are the same. Uh, Right, and then of course we do this and we take the limit as t goes to zero uh, of the expression. Um, again, I mean, for many of you, this will be uh, something you've known since, since kindergarten and in that, that case, just ignore me. But if, if it's not the case, um, let me just highlight for martingales with jumps, just like the, the, in the, just like the, the one we're talking about now, this, um, this uh, pointy quadratic variation does not coincide with what I would perhaps refer to more as the normal quadratic variation, which is defined more like what you would see in a course on standard stochastic calculus, say. Um, and I would just kind of like to kind of challenge you with a couple of, um, of quick exercises. So for example, the uh, easiest example of a jump martingale is a compensated Poisson process where you just take, well, a standard Poisson process and you subtract here T, so Poisson process with intensity one. And in that case, you can see that it's quite, <laughs> quite clear that these things are different. So in this case, this predictable, uh, so the kind of the, the normal quadratic variation, what you have to do is you just sum up to time T and you sum up all the jumps, well, which actually have size one. And you square them. Okay, squaring of a jump of type, type, type one doesn't do very much. So this just counts the number of jumps that you've had up to time t. Whereas this predictable quadratic variation would actually be equal to t. So it's it's I mean it's obviously different. And just to note here that this is also again for somebody who has only heard learned continuous stochastic calculus before you know you've learned the Levy characterization that tells you that every continuous martingale uh, that has quadratic variation t is a Brownian motion. And this example also shows you uh, 
uh, shows you that uh, the continuous is an important assumption in this uh, in this theorem. So because here you have a martingale with at least predictable quadratic variation equal to t, um, and I mean it's clearly not Brownian motion, uh, and uh, I mean. I mean, okay, the, 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 it's not a contradiction, of course, to the theorem because this is not a continuous martingale. Um, there is a, as a, as a, I mean, this is an exercise, so, so, so I mean, it's not very difficult, so please do it. And um, more generally, if you have a jump mark, uh, if you have, a, you have a Markov process or a jump Markov process, just like, like the one we're looking at, and you look at the martingale, which is, uh, which is given to you in this form, so exactly the type that, we're ha that we have, then you can actually write down pretty explicitly what the predictable quadratic variation of that martingale is. And it has uh, this form here. So it's an integral from zero to T of, uh, I mean, this funny thing here. So you take uh, your test function, you, the test function that you use to define the martingale, you square it, you act on it with the, uh, with the, op with the generator, and then you subtract here this, uh, this uh, kind of cross thing where you uh, multiply the uh, function itself with a generator acting on the function. Uh, this thing is called Carré du champ operator. Um, yeah, I, I mean, again, if you've uh, not heard it before, then just do the exercise. It's not uh, extremely complicated. Also, you can just check that for uh, if uh, L is, for example, the Laplacian, for minus the Laplacian for Brownian motion, then this Carré du champ. So then you have L F squared minus two uh, two F L F is just a gradient of F squared. I'm not sure if I got the vectors right, but let me, in order to not make a cor incorrect statement, let me just write dx squared. Perhaps a half somewhere. No, I don't think there's a half. Milton, is there a half? Yes. Where's the half? In front of the Laplacian. So, okay, is it true now? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, good. So this is um, this is uh, that. And now in particular, this is uh, something that um, is a continuation of this exercise. In this uh, Curie-Weiss case, uh, you have that the quadratic, the predictable quadratic variation is given by this identity. So you have here a, um, uh, you have here an, Average over the over all the the sites where a spin can happen, where where a jump can happen, and um, then you then and then you you sum over the jump and intensity at that point, and then you integrate that up in time. Okay, and uh, I mean the intuition for this is uh, perhaps not so complicated, in particular for this one over n squared. It's just uh, you have uh, in the in the mean magnetization you have a one over n, and this is something that is quadratic. So you, I mean, right? I mean, the, uh, the, you have sort of the the square of that. So this is why this one over n comes and uh, one over n squared comes here. And of course, what is important to note is overall this is a quantity which should be of order one over n. And uh, also to be to note here is that this quantity that one integrates up here. This is just an average, so this is kind of a, a one. And the C here, we had already seen that this is always bounded by one. Uh, and in particular, even a bit more precisely, uh, we should really think of this as a half plus error. So overall, it's not such a bad idea to think of this whole quantity as, uh, so this a half times four gives you a two. So it's not so bad to think of this as T times two over N roughly speaking, plus error. Okay. And so now I'm waving my hand a little bit, but possibly not so much. So I think it's perhaps justifiable um, to say, well, this actually looks like it's a reasonable approximation to think that this mean magnetization uh, should roughly follow this equation here. So you have a minus from the generator, you got this minus S plus the tonge of uh, of beta ms. So the only cheat that I've done here is that I've re 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 disregarded here this um, this term of order one over n, which appeared here in the in the tunch. But well, okay, that's that's allowed. That's allow, allow, I said a reasonable approximation. So I think that's that's fair that cheat. And then here you have this dms, and now I'm going to make a slightly bigger leap, where I say, well, okay, the jumps of this are going to be small that that we had seen. 
the predictable quadratic variation is roughly uh, two over n well, times t. Uh, so perhaps it's not such a bad idea to replace this by one over square root of n times the Brownian motion. Um, perhaps I can ask the audience again, are you happy with this approximation or do you think I'm cheating too much? Everyone looks happy. Thanks, Hendrik. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. So then, but then we, but that, okay, if at this point, if we believe that, then I think we have a pretty good in the analysis of this of the system and we can actually now uh, proceed to, to, to really understand quite well what's happening. Um, so here I've just copied on the top of the page this, um, uh, this, uh, this SDE that we had here with this uh, small noise here. So, I mean, important is this term here is leading order doesn't come with a one over square root of n and this term here is much. Um, okay, so we, we have this SDE and I just what I was just saying, if you didn't hear it, the other thing to, to point out immediately is you have a one over square root of n in front of the noise and you don't have such a one over square root of n in front of the drift. So it seems reasonable to accept the fact that the, um, that the, that the, the drift would be dominant to leading order. And uh, so, and that actually corresponds to this, I mean, toy hydrodynamic limit in this case. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating a bit to use this fancy word for something so simple, but, um, but I mean, that's sort of what happens here. So the to leading order as n goes to infinity, the noise should actually not matter so much. And one would, could think as n goes to infinity, this should just converge to- So Hendrik, yeah. if you are so ashamed to use hydrodynamic limit, you can use fluid limit. Okay, why is that a better name? Because in fluid limits, usually you get ODEs instead of, uh, of PDEs. Okay, I didn't know that. So I mean, so this is a fluid limit then? Yeah. Okay, good. So I'll use the word fluid limit. Thanks, Martin. So fluid limit I can use without feeling bad about it. Okay, good. Okay, so then, um, so that's, that's fine. So now let's, uh, let's, uh, let's see how this behaves. And I mean, first of all, here, let me just recall, I mean, this is the tunch function. Uh, again, uh, this is a plot, it goes to, goes, I mean, of course, I'm, I presume that most of you know that, but it goes here from minus one to plus one, just to remind you. And the important thing here that we will use a lot is this Taylor approximation. So tunch of X, at least for small X is given by X minus X cubed over three plus order X of five. And uh, so in particular for M small, which is the, the what we will, uh, mostly be interested in, I can actually replace uh, this, uh, this term m minus tanj beta m by just using this Taylor approximation, just the first two terms. So you have here this beta minus one m. So this, uh, this beta m comes from this x here, and then the minus one comes from here. Okay, and then the, the beta cubed over three m comes from this here. Okay. And now, so this is actually something that uh, is not so complicated to analyze and we can do it. So let's first of all, look at this kind of high temperature regime where beta is less than one. I mean, you see perhaps immediately in this, uh, in this drift term here that, the, the, that there's something special happening for beta equal to one. So for, for beta bigger than one, this will be, uh, this will be positive this term. And so this pushes you away from the origin and for beta less than one, this pushes you towards the origin. And so let's look at this, what I call high temperature regime first. So for, for beta less than one. And again, so here I have a plot of this function M minus tanj beta M, and this is a plot for beta equal to two third. So not so far away from, from one. Okay. Is it safe to discard the term in the tanj, the error and then keep them? That's a good question. Um, I think yes. Is the, uh, so sorry, uh, Francesco asks uh, if it's safe to discard the term n minus one in the in the tanj term and then keep a Brownian noise with magnitude n to the minus a half in the hydrodynamic limit. And um, I think the answer is yes. It's okay. But uh, yes, good. And uh, so so this is the this is the the plot here for beta equal to two third. And uh, then you see, if you just look at this with your eyeball metric, so this is of course positive here, this function, um, this positive here for negative values of M and then negative for positive values of M. So you kind of get pushed towards the origin. And uh, what you see quite easily is that M will converge to zero exponentially fast. So I mean, the leading, the dominant term of course is this one here. So you have an exponential decay, exponential decay to zero 
and uh, the further away from the, from one you are with your beta, the quicker you you converge to zero. Uh, now let's have a look at the low temperature regime. So for beta bigger than one, so now this is the opposite situation. This uh, this uh, this value beta bigger than one um, um, does uh, now this this pushes you away from the origin. You see the plot looks quite different. Uh, you have this double well shape here for this this function. You have a non have non you have the, the zero now becomes uh, becomes repellent. So solution that start near here will go away. And you have these attractive fixed points here for the system here. These are uh, I mean it's symmetric. So this these are plus minus and beta. I mean yeah, and you have these uh, these exponentially stable fixed point here at, at these non-trivial values uh, and beta. And uh, so the, the idea is that un unless you start your magnetization mag mag exactly at zero, uh, for the ODE, you will converge eventually either to this, uh, this, this value or to this value, okay? And now the, uh, the, interesting, the interesting situation for critical beta. So let's have a look for beta equal to one. And now, this, uh, this function m minus tanj can to leading order be described by this term. And you see, I mean, this still has the property that it's, uh, that it's uh, slightly, wait, um, did I do, do this right? Uh, right, exactly. So it's slightly negative. It's hard to see on the plot. It's slightly negative for forty positive values of m, and it's slightly positive for negative values of m. But I mean, on this plot, it's already hard to tell. And what this means is that it still converges to zero, but extremely much more slowly. And uh, I mean, again, you know that the solution of that ODE x dot is uh, one over square root of c plus plus well, plus square root of plus t. So this does converge to zero as you um, as you uh, as you increase for time to infinity, but much more slowly. So before you had exponential decay toward expand exponential stability. And here it only goes to it goes to zero, like one over square root. So this is really I mean, much much slower convergence. Okay. Good. Now let's have a look at fluctuations around this the, around this. And I will do this uh, in the linear case only for the low temperature regime. For, so for the high temperature regime where your fluctuations around zero. So let's assume now beta is less than one. Um, and for simplicity, I will uh, I will start this uh, this ODE for in the in the uh, in uh, with m with with initial datum zero, which just makes it a little bit easier. And now the solution of the ODE would be extremely boring; it would just stay zero for all times. And now let's have a look at the next order corrections to that. Okay, so I'm looking at this equation again, the DMS here, and then you have um, uh, and then you have here this. Uh, I do this replacement here again by this cubic uh, by this cubic term, and I'm going to now blow the whole thing up by um, with a with a factor square root of n. Uh, and then what you see is this uh, this factor square root of n. This makes this uh, makes this Brown and Martingale here much bigger, so this becomes a square root of two. Uh, and then here on the level of this beta minus one. You um, you multiply this with the square root of n, but now you measure things in terms of this xs. So you have you set you pay with the same square root of n, so nothing happens with this one. But here with the cubic term, you get the same beta beta cubed over three. Uh, but now, as you want to put uh, instead of an m cubed, you want to write it in terms of x cubed, and you have to pay for that with a one over n here. Okay, so this will become relatively smaller to that as uh, as n goes to infinity. Which of course is reasonable, right? Because we're kind of assuming that we have very small value. We are zooming in for very small values of m, and then the m cubed is of course much smaller than uh, uh, is much smaller, smaller than m. And so, as we now let in this uh, in this analysis, let n go to infinity, we will just recover this. Just goes away, and we will just recover the the linear on a linear auto Winback process. So this is the. the uh, this is um, this is here. You will just see Gaussian fluctuations. So now, so do you mind on, reading on, let me go to question the out? Uh, Sorry, is it? There's a question in the chat. Yeah, uh, I saw this. Let me just read it. Um, what's the question? 
Uh, following the one over n was thrown away way in the fluctuation. Okay, so I think it's okay, no, because uh, in the tunch you had this uh, term of order one over n, and that should then, I mean, that should then produce a term of order one over n, and you just blow it up with a square root of n. Shouldn't that be okay? I'm not going to go beyond the CLT. Ah, wait, I am going to go to beyond, but I think it's still okay. Let's have a look. But so far, you're happy, Francesco. Good. So then let's do the next thing and let's see that if I was too careless because in the cuts easing, which I will kind of come to later, we throw it away because we didn't want to deal with it. I hope I wasn't too careless with this one. Now let's have a look at the criticality where, uh, and let's see if, if Francesco spoiled, uh, caught me being too careless. Um, so now we're going to, uh, we're going to um, choose a beta, which is now close to one, but we're allowing ourselves a small, um, a small um, uh, uh, error in that. So this is a, this is a, the beta bar. Um, and again, here I've just copied again the equation for this, uh, this DMS, which is given by here this linear part and then here the cubic part and here this, uh, this small Brownian motion. Again, I start for simplicity with, uh, with the mean magnetization equal to zero. Now I'm going to do two things. I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, uh, blow things up with a one over square root of delta delta to be determined, and I'm also going to look at large spatial scales um, where we have to accelerate time. Uh, so then, if I plug this thing into this equation here, I get here in this drift. I get from the fact that I have accelerated time, I get a one over alpha in front, and I get the one over delta here. Um, and I see that possibly Francesco is right. I have to see. No, no, I think it's still okay. Uh, so you have this here. Here I write this beta minus one that comes from here copied, and I have the I have just rewritten. I had an m, and I rewrite that m in terms of delta as a delta xt. And I have the same thing here. I had this uh, this m cubed, and I write it as a delta cubed xt, and then I have higher order. And then I have here a square root of two, and then here I have this, and then the uh, one over delta from the blowing up of the noise. And the only thing uh, where, where I'm, I mean, a bit bold, but possibly not too bold, is that, that I use Brownian rescaling here, where I say that if I rescale this by an, uh, if I rescale this by an alpha, uh, if I rescale time by alpha, this, this uh, gives me a one over square root of alpha in the, uh, in the noise. Okay. Everybody happy with this? Okay. Milton seems happy. Good. Thanks. Okay. And now I'm just uh, plugging in. So I use my, uh, uh, the definition beta minus one, I've called this beta bar. Uh, I plug in that delta cancels with that delta, that alpha goes here. So that I get, I get an XT. Uh, here, I'm just going to use an approximation that beta is essentially one plus an error. So I'm going to drop the beta cubed in this term. And I just take the delta, delta, delta cubed. One delta goes away with this delta here. So that gives me delta squared and the one over alpha still stays. And then here I've done nothing. Here I've just copied, uh, except that I've moved the square root of two here, which okay doesn't do very much. And now let's uh, pick our parameters in the correct way. Um, so I want to make these uh, I want to make this prefactors here one. So I have this prefactor, and I want to have this prefactor here. So I want this to be one, and I want this one to be one. And this means that I have to uh, I have to choose delta equal to n to the minus a quarter an alpha equal to n to the minus a half. Okay, I mean, you can solve this. This is uh, what one has to do. And um, okay, and, and this, if one makes this choice here, then one gets, um, then one gets here uh, a one in the prefactor here and one gets one in the prefactor here. And still an interesting choice that one has to make is, so what do I want to do with my temperature? So I had told you, um, that, I mean, certainly I want to close, choose this uh, beta close to one. So this uh, beta bar should be close to zero, but here you can actually read off how close to zero it has to be. So here you can see, well, well this thing better be close to be of order one, which means we ch should choose this, uh, this beta bar 
of order one over alpha and alpha we have just figured is n to the minus a half. So we can allow ourselves to not choose the beta exactly equal to one, but we can allow ourselves to, um, uh, no, it's correct, right? So I can allow myself, uh, I can allow myself, um, uh, I can allow myself to deviate from this critical value uh, beta equal to uh, equal to one by uh, in a correction of order one over square root of n. Okay, and I will still get something sensible here. Okay, and so if we make this choice, then we get this quite nice uh, SDE here. So you get here um, the uh, this a that I have picked n by hand. This order this order one over square root of n uh, shift to the critical value. Then you have here this cubic term, and then you have here this order one noise. Okay, so you get the um, noise. And back to Francesco, I think I didn't cheat too much because in this formula here you're still okay, no? Because here you just get a one over n to a quarter, and here you just a one over n to a half. So I think the one over n still gets gets killed by it. Yes, I think so too. Good. But as I told you in the cast easing thing, we we discussed this away by just removing it, and I'll show you in a minute how we do this. But um, okay. Good. So then you get uh, then you get uh, get get this uh, get this equation, and now let's have a look at that. Okay. So okay, here I've just restated what we have just basically proved. So let uh, let let let's look at this situation. So we have an initial we have an initial configuration, uh, and we assume that if you multiply that with an n to a half, then you converge to some real number. And this is already a non-trivial assumption here, right, that we've put in this analysis. I would call this well-prepared initial data. So this is, um, this is a, con I mean, a convergence of Markov processes in the end of the day, but we need to assume that the initial data already converges in a sensible way. And uh, we choose, a, uh, we choose a, uh, a temperature which is kind of close to this critical value plus a correction of order one over square root of n. So this is, I would call this the critical value, the window. And then we observe with the observable that we look at is we just as in this linear Gaussian fluctuation case, we blow up everything by a factor n to a half. But at the same time, we also accelerate our time. So we look at larger time scales with an n to a quarter. And then we get convergence in law of this thing to the solution of an SDE. And okay, this is convergence in law with respect to the topology of uh, of the Skoro hot space, and this xt solves the equation that I have just written down with the with the correct initial datum. So let's look at this a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, so the role of this a. So if you look at this SDE here, so you have here this is the SDE again from the previous slide. I've just copied it. So this is of course this defines a Markov process, and this is reversible with respect to this measure e to the minus v dx. And the, the v is just, I mean, the, the v is determined by the fact that the minus the derivative of v should be this. So this is a v, v is a 12, one over 12 x to the four minus a over two x to x squared. And what is quite uh, noteworthy here is uh, that, um, is that uh, kind of the role of the a. Uh, the depending on how you how what sign of a you choose, uh, you will get a quite different picture how this potential v looks. So in this case where uh, where a is negative, so this is the case where you um, where you choose the the temperature still in this critical win the window, but you choose it just a little bit above the the, the value one. You get this nice convex potential here. So the the so the I mean the both terms here then have the same sign, and this is the this I mean yeah this high temperature regime you want to go close to um, to these uh, uh, to zero. Whereas if you are for positive uh, a, so this means in this critical window you have uh, chosen your beta just a little bit above one, which means the temperature was just a little bit below well not because it's inverse temperature. Uh, so then you see again this double well picture here. Uh, and um, uh, so the the the, the potential lives here. The, the the Markov process likes to live more, live live more here. So this is actually kind of interesting. So even even though you have uh, 
I mean, you have zoomed in, you still have in this, even in the limit, you have this parameter A. So this question between high or low temperature survives this limiting procedure. You still have a parameter to choose in the model, okay? Uh, any questions at this point? So how do you play in the game of uh, sending A to infinity now? Why would I want to send A to infinity? Because then uh, uh, your, uh, your potential will be more, more and more concentrated in these two peaks that uh, you just uh, drew. Yeah. And well, it would be fun to play that game. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'll play that game once I have spatial coordinates as well, but I will not play it. I mean, for now, I think this would just mean if I make A further, A bigger and bigger, then I move further and further away from this uh, critical beta where I see these interesting nonlinear non dynamics. I would move more and more into this regime, into this high temperature regime where I should really look at the fluctuations around this point. No, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of regime you're looking at, but of course, I mean, cho choosing. Choosing a much, much bigger would correspond to looking at the fluctuations more around, if you go to the hydrodynamic thing, or, or sorry, the, the fluid limit, it looks more, then you should have to look around fluctuations around this point rather than around zero. Yeah, I was thinking more of a question of large deviations type of things, no? Okay. That if you, if you, if you, if you send A very slowly to infinity, maybe you are able to see the transition between these two guys using, using, using this equation. Perhaps I'm not sure. Um, so there's a question in the in the chat. You meant extremely low temperature. I think that question is directed at you, Milton. If I understand correctly. Yeah. No, no. I just I just mean a little bit low temperature. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, anyway, the picture that I drew here, I perhaps want to stress: this is never extremely low temperature. This is. Uh, uh, because the, the, the temperature is still very much close to one, right? I mean, I'm talking about temperature beta is equal to one plus A over N to a half. So uh, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just playing around in this critical window and I'm moving a little bit away from this one, but I'm, I'm being quite careful not to move too far. I mean, otherwise you would not see these, uh, see these nonlinear fluctuations. Otherwise you would just see an alternate one by process around uh, right. I mean, the thing is that uh, in this in this uh, in this in this equation that you in this hydrodynamic equation uh, above here, you have to leading order. You have to leading order. You have the drift, and then you have the and then you have here the noise only at scale one over square root of n. And uh, and in order to see this uh, this um, in order to see this uh, nonlinear fluctuations, you have to really zoom in around the point where this one is pretty small. So where where I mean around around. Uh, Wait, where, where do I have it? Sorry, um, I'm, I should never zoom like that. But uh, yeah, you're basically zooming in around this one where this drift is extremely small. Otherwise, if you didn't do that, the, the linear Gaussian dynamics would always dominate everything. But I mean, you only have a chance to see these nonlinear dynamics because you zoom in here, where the where the nonlinear where this 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 uh, where this drift term wants to be very small. Okay, so I certainly don't mean very very low temperature. So there's a couple of comments on the literature. I mean, first of all, the, this, this analysis of the scurry weiss model is certainly not the only way of doing it. And uh, there, there are multiple ways of, uh, multiple other ways of analyzing the scurry weiss model. Um, just your reference, one, one, one way of doing it, which I like very much is in this book by, uh, by Bauer, Schmidt, Bridges and Slade in the introduction. Uh, well, I mean, okay, it's just a, a completely different analysis of the static Curie Weiss model that I would recommend people to look at because I think it's quite elegant. Um, then another point I want to just stress is that again, this fact that you have e to the minus x to the four fluctuations in Curie Weiss near criticality, if you zoom, zoom your parameters correctly, is again extremely classical. And this is, for example, the technical core of the so called Griffith Simon approximation. So there's um, there's a, I mean, really famous paper from the, by, by, by Griffith and Simon from the 70s uh, that shows that you can uh, recover 5.4, this the static 5.4 model, not the, not the SPDE, um, uh, by a two-scale limiting procedure from an easing type model. And uh, this observation for the mean field model is really at the heart of what they do. Uh, so, I mean, their motivation was to show that certain correlation inequalities that hold for easing models that they're still true 
for for field theories. So um, so so that's uh, uh, that's uh, and and then this this mean field analysis in equilibrium is, is really the technical core of what they do here. And I mean, this is a, a fun exercise. Perhaps for, for perhaps for Milton, you can tell me the solution because I actually I didn't work it out. Uh, so it's, it's possibly a hard exercise. So use this convergence of the dynamic model to actually deduce the result in equilibrium. So to deduce that the actual um, equilibrium models converge to to this uh, e to the minus x to the four measure. And this is um, not a completely completely trivial task because. I mean, at least in terms of statement, it doesn't logically follow from us, right? Because the way I phrased the theorem was more a convergence of, if you want Markov semigroups. I assume that the initial datum converges and then the whole evolution that converges, that starts with that initial datum, that that, uh, that, that would convert. That's what I stated. Uh, but that does not a priori imply that if you start the, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the in the approximation, if you start the, the particle model in, in equilibrium, which is not an unreasonable thing to do, that that would satisfy this convergence result. So you need some, some compactness or tightness result there. And uh, I think it's actually an interesting task to work out if you can use this, uh, you can use this, um, this conversion of the Markov pro pro processes to, to effectively uh, state the convergence of the invariant measure, or perhaps even quantify in which how fast this convergence holds. And just, uh, I mean, kind of two references in the spirit. So there's this paper that I already mentioned before by, uh, by Martin and uh, Massimo Ibati. And they did this actually for 542. So they, um, uh, so I mean, I have an optimism to, sure to, 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 to guess that this can be done for, for, the, for the mean field model because it was done in this more complicated case. So they proved the matching tightness statement for 542 and uh, used it to, uh, to, to deduce uh, to deduce the convergence of the measure from the convergence of these Markov processes. So this is a one remark and a, a second remark that I just like kind of the philosophical uh, kind of uh, uh, comparison. I find that this is a bit similar to what is done in Stein's method where one, um, where one wants to prove the convergence of certain measures to Gaussian or to other measures. And the way one quantifies that this convergence is by how much uh, the the measure annihilates or or doesn't annihilate a certain characteristic operator for the limiting measure, and in this case here, this would be the uh, the generator for the Markov process. Okay, so I just find this uh, philosophically a similar uh, kind of a nice similarity, and I would find it actually kind of kind of fun to see either have this pointed out to me in the literature. I don't know if this has been done, or just to show me that it can be done to to quantify the convergence in equilibrium using these conversions of these Markov generators. Milton, do you know if this has been done? Yeah, uh, so you should actually ask uh, Gerardo, which is in the room down there, okay. which uh, has some results on this direction, but I, I, I'm not completely sure if uh, what he did uh, cover the, your, your exact question, but it's, I'm pretty sure it covers some similar question related uh, somehow. So I'd be very curious to learn about that then. So please uh, send me an email or... Uh... Uh, so it seems Kavita also wants something. Yeah, so just in the context of other. <laughs> so, thank you. Sorry, in the context of um, other kinds of Markov processes that arise in sort of in, uh, interacting particle systems arising in engineering, there has been work in which they look at the. You, this is sort of this interchange of limits is something that's mm -hmm. been well studied. And in particular, uh, there's been recent work where you try to use Stein's method in order to prove direct convergence of the equilibrium without going through the dynamics. But of course you have to identify the generator of the limit dynamics. So yeah. Right, yeah, that's that's what I meant. I mean, basically I'm proving here convergence of the generator, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so, so this I, has I can, been done I in can, this. I can send you references of, of something that's been done in that context. So it's been done for sort of mean field systems that for jump certain kinds of jump Markov processes. Okay. by works of Yaling and um, even to get quantitative, because uh, Stein's method is useful in getting quantitative approximations. Right, that's, that's uh, just point, yeah. Yep, uh, Yaling, Anton Braverman. Yeah, I can send you references if you want. Thanks. So and would you at least agree that my exercise is hard? <laughs> just for, um, I mean, okay. I mean, I know this has been done also in this context here for for these five four SPDE, but um, but uh, but for the for these quite quite complicated measures, 
Um, I, I, there it hasn't been quantified and I think it would actually be still fun to, to do that and to, uh, and to quantify how fast these convergences actually hold. I, I, I believe that, uh, that in the scalar mean field case that this is possibly not so hard, I don't know. Okay, good. Um, so perhaps I should ask the organizers, Paul, what should I do now? It's uh, 28, 29 past. I can either jump to conclusions or as I started five minutes later, I can also still speak about cuts easing for five minutes. Um, maybe jump to conclusions. Yeah, okay, okay. An extra five minutes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's lunch really after this you, anyway, right? we have some time. Uh, yeah. Much sharp. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I mean, so the conclusions up to now would just be, so what I've shown you is this analysis of this dynamic Q revised model, depending on beta. And I mean, there was this effect, the mean magnetization for, uh, for beta, lar beta larger than one, the mean magnetization just goes to zero. Uh, this is this high temperature regime and for uh, beta less than one, not zero. Uh, then, then, uh, then you get these non-trivial magnetic mag uh, spontaneous magnetization. So plus minus and beta uh, not equal to zero and they will converge to that. And I'm, I've shown you the fluctuations for, uh, for beta close to be bigger than one. And um, I had argued that this was uh, then given by a Gaussian or Sebunberg process in line with the general philosophy that I had at the, had at the beginning that you have, um, uh, that you have um, uh, well, around the hydrodynamic limit that you should see, uh, that you should see Gaussian fluctuations. And uh, the uh, the interesting case that well, I hope interesting case that I that I touched on at the end is this uh, situation where you're close to uh, close to one, and of close to criticality, and then you actually see a nonlinear STEs, you see non-Gaussian fluctuations arising in a specific scaling. And uh, the other point that I wanted to stress, and that will come up again when I speak about the spatial models, is that you actually I have this additional parameter a. Uh, which, um, uh, which, which allows that. So there's still a notion of high or low temperature in the limit, and you can uh, adjust that by zooming in the in the uh, into the into the critical temperature at the in the correct way. Okay. Um, perhaps I won't talk very very much about cuts easing, just as an outlook for for what will happen, um, what what I will talk about uh, on, on 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 Thursday. So I'll start again on Wednesday. I will start again with this slide. Um, but so what I want to do is I reintroduce now the lattice and I want to, um, uh, I will want to, uh, uh, well, I mean, not go to, to only mean field, I want to make the model a little bit more interesting, so I want to um, uh, do that. And the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to use, look at this cuts potential. So this is now again my, uh, my easing model here on, on my lattice, so this is the same as I had before. And I will look at a very specific form of interaction. So this is actually copied from what I had before. Uh, so again, this is the general form an easing model with a given interaction kernel and here this is the Gibbs measure. Uh, and um, so the specific form of interaction I will look at is of this form. So I take a smooth kernel, think of your favorite compactly supported, certainly non-negative uh, function and you rescale it in, in this way here. So you, um, uh, so you multiply here the arguments by, uh, by gamma, which means that if the original kernel has compact support, say in a ball of radius one, then this will be non-vanishing non for spins, which are a distance of order one over gamma. So this is what I've tried to denote here in this cartoon, where uh, kind of this spin in the origin sees all other spins that are a distance at most gamma inverse. And what you then do is you multiply with a gamma to the D. Uh, and in particular, uh, I, mean, I mean, I've put this proportional, you, you make a constant such that the, uh, such that the, uh, to the total magnitude, the total interaction of everything sums up to one. And what one should think of here is now that this is sort of a smooth indicator function. So I would, I mean, the analysis is nicer if you have a smooth function here, but at least morally, you would really want to think of, uh, of this just being an indicator function where each uh, where each particle here sees all other particles in a box of distance uh, of distance uh, at most gamma inverse, and then you um, I mean you you renormalize it so that uh, each particle here interacts with each other particle here. So the, the interaction between two given particles is going to be pretty small, like gamma to the d. And um, I mean, so this is a, a local mean field model in the sense that 
the, the field, the, say the spin here, does not interact with everything, but it does interact still with an average of particles over a large box. So it's a it's an interpolation between the nearest neighbor easing model, which would correspond to the case where this gamma is just fixed equal to one, and you only see the nearest neighbors, and the Curie-Weiss model, which corresponds to gamma equal to zero, where everything just interacts with everything and the whole geometry is lost. And uh, so this, I mean, just as an outlook for next time, this uh, little gamma here will give me a, a bit more playroom to then choose my parameters and I'll manage to tune this in order to give me a nonlinear SPDE. And then I'll show this at the very beginning of next time how this works. And then from there, I'll jump to the other side and I'll talk about SPDEs, okay? So that's okay. the agenda. I think this is a good point to stop. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Andrew. Okay, we have some time for some quick questions. Anyone has any in the audience? So yeah, thank you for the great lecture. And um, so is it the case that for any general system, we can actually find a good parameters that it exhibits a nonlinear um, fluctuation? Or is it the case that only some kind of special systems exhibit the nonlinear fluctuation? I, I certainly wouldn't make a claim that for any system you can find nonlinear fluctuations. Uh, no, I think there's some, um, I mean, I'm not sure how general a statement I want to make here. Um, at least for these nonlinear SPDEs, one really has to tune a system pretty well in near some critical values. And as I will explain next week, and but I already mentioned uh, next week, uh, next lecture on Wednesday, and as I already mentioned in, in the beginning when I spoke about the KPZ equation, is um, actually for, for these nonlinear SPDEs, what one has to do is you have this extra parameter. And so the weak asymmetry in the KPZ, and, and here this will be the, the this, this interaction range and in the, in the cuts potential uh, that one has to tune as one zooms out. So one. Uh, I would rather say that these non, at least these nonlinear. Okay, perhaps, perhaps let me just. Okay, let me perhaps just not answer the question now and refer you to next time because I'll speak a bit about this micro universality picture, and uh, I'll, I'll give a better answer next time. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thanks again. Henry. There was a, oh, sorry. a question oh. in the chat, which is, could you explain what is interesting about non-Gaussian fluctuations versus, versus Gaussian fluctuations? Um, I mean, I would just say, I mean, kind of perhaps just as a naive answer, we're all taught in our course probability one that the, uh, the, we're taught about the CLT and we're taught that fluctuations by default are Gaussian and we like, we like to think of, uh, of, of, uh, of, I mean, of this picture that we have a, um, that we have a deterministic law of large numbers and then we have Gaussian fluctuations around this. And if we have special situations where this is not true and where you see different behaviors, I would argue that that's interesting, but you may disagree with me on that. Is okay, that a satisfactory again. answer? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew. Thanks again.